Greetings, everyone. Free here. Welcome to the Demo Hub. Welcome to another exciting episode. Today, we have a fascinating guest and a fascinating product. Our guest for today is Matt David. Matt is the Director of Growth at uh, Datafold. Matt is going to join us today and talk about Datafold. And more importantly, we're going to see a demo. Matt, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Glad to have you. Where are you calling from, Matt? San Francisco. Oh, San Francisco. That's that's awesome. I think the technology hub in San Francisco is something that always fascinates me being someone out here in the Midwest. So really cool. Can you talk about Datafold for the folks out there who don't know what Datafold is or who are curious to hear about what this is a modern data tool is? Yeah, so Datafold, kind of the founding story is uh, Gleb, our, our founder. He used to work at Lyft. He was making kind of a routine fixed to some SQL code inside of a data pipeline, just a three line edit. And then later that night, got a very urgent call that the whole rides table for Lyft came crashing to a halt. He got into a war room with a bunch of other data engineers and they couldn't even figure out what was going on, why, why it happened for, I believe it took them almost two days for them to figure out it was just Gleb's three line edit. And that edit was reviewed when he submitted it and that sort of thing as well. So he obviously never wanted to have that happen ever again. So he thought, you know, what, what sort of tooling might give me the visibility whenever I make a change to some SQL code in a data pipeline, what could, what could show me all the downstream consequences of that change before I pushed it to production? And that's exactly what Datafold does. So Datafold provides kind of a preview or an impact report, if you will, as to what your pull request is going to do to production before you merge anything to production. So just a, is a by far like a, a data best practice, and mm -hmm. we're really excited about the impact it could have on data quality for companies around the world. Oh, yeah. I think that story you shared there with your founder is something that a lot of people can relate to. Making a change that seems inconsequential, and the executives are calling reporting issues in production, which... Exactly. Most of us have been been through the the ringer for that, so yeah. pretty fascinating. Pretty fascinating. What what space does does this play in? Is this more on a data quality then, or observability, or is it a, a new area we're building out here? How would you describe that? Yeah, so we definitely kind of fall broadly under data quality. Yeah, you know, we're really focused on kind of the developer workflow, the kind of CI/CD mm -hmm. parts of working in data. So this is still kind of an emerging tool space in, in the modern data stack and in data in general. So DBT gave us quite a lot of tools to, that make kind of the CI CD part a lot easier. You kind of get staging and production out of the box when you adopt DBT. And we're kind of, we see ourselves largely as carrying that torch forward and providing even more kind of tooling around that developer workflow experience. We do often get kind of compared to these other tools, but we really are rather complementary to most of the other traditional observability tools out there. So oh, most okay. observ like most observability tools are trying to catch things in production, what, what looks weird. Mm -hmm. But and you're trying to go back to the source and catch it within the development lifecycle before it even makes it to production. Correct. So, so there, you can think of it as like a, we break things and then like they break things. So mm -hmm. we break things as data engineers, analytics engineers. If we put in bad code, we, we broke the data. That's what Datafold's focused on. Now, there is other situations where, let's say, they broke the data. So upstream, maybe your engineers changed how some event was instrumented. Perhaps your third-party vendor of some type of data changed their schema or Fivetran changed how they were mm -hmm. modeling the data. And now all of a sudden, that, that kind of cascades through into production. And you know the monitoring or observability tools that are out there, they're going to catch those. Um, mm -hmm. so they kind of catch the they break data, but we think... All the times that we break data, you should use Datafold versus having all of that extra stuff go through to the monitoring tools. Oh, okay. That's pretty fascinating. I think someone wants, you might know who this person is famous, said move fast and break things. But I think what you're saying here is move fast, but don't break things for yeah. the data engineering teams then. I exactly. Yes. All right. Let's, let's jump into the demo. Awesome. Yeah. So Datafold, again, is really focused on the workflow. So we're going to start inside of a pull request. So let's pretend we work at a data or at a, a beer e-commerce store and we want to change the 
how we're rating beers. So in the past, maybe we only rated them malty and hoppy, but now we want to have an extra malty category, a well-balanced category, and an extra hoppy category in addition to those original two. So it seems like kind of a simple change to make. Okay, so just from a context perspective, the, let's say we're starting from a point where code exists already. The business comes in with requirements to so the development team to say, go make changes here, add new columns. And now that development team has to go make that change. And I think what you're going to tell us here is how that change can be made without breaking things downstream. Am I? You're nailing okay. it. Yep, exactly. Okay, perfect. So if we then go and kind of look at the pull request itself, when you make this pull request, you're going to kick off, if you have data folder integrated with your CI process, it's going to kick off what we call a data diff. So on that table that we just Just edited, to double click on that and apologize, when you say data fold integrated with the CI process, what does that mean? Is that something that the team now has to install that plugs in into Git or where is that integration happening? Yeah, so, so Datafold, we need to be integrated to your data warehouse. We mm -hmm. need to be integrated to your repo, so in this case, GitHub. And then whatever you know tooling you're using for the orchestration side of things. So DBT, DBT Cloud, Airflow, that sort of thing. Oh, okay. And once, you're, once you do you know, go through those, which we've made pretty easy at this point, and you, and you do any sort of pull request, it's going to kick off, uh, again, what we call a data diff. And so if... If we remember, we are editing this table here, beers.sql. So if we look, we have this same, this same beers table here, and it's showing us what, what that change is doing to it. So you can see this is the, the main branch, which is what production is, and then this is our branch here, this expand IBU categorization. And so we didn't change the total number of rows, which makes sense. We're just increasing the number of categories within a column, we're not adding more rows or adding mm -hmm. more columns. So again, as we would expect, there's no difference in the number of columns and there's no difference in, in most of the other key indicators here. But what, what we do see is that within one column, there is differing values. There's about 712 rows specifically that have new values in them. Mm -hmm. And out of all the values across the whole table, about 4% have been impacted by this change. So if we want to look at this more closely, we can actually look at specifically which, which values did change. And so this is, you know, typically when people make changes to a data model and a data pipeline, they have to go run a bunch of ad hoc queries to kind of validate like what actually did happen to the data. And Datable kind of automates that and puts it together in these nice reports. So here we can see you know, what the IBU ratings were and then what it used to be and then what it's rated as now. And if we went back and checked our code here, you know, again, we wanted with an IBU less than 20 to now be rated extra multi. And we can see indeed now that this is 15 is less than 20, so it is being, you know, reassigned as extra multi. So this oh, okay. just makes kind of validating your changes a lot easier. And that's kind of, you know, the value kind of prop number one, just kind of removing all that ad hoc querying to validate your change did what you thought it would on the oh, table okay. you were working on. But where it really gets more valuable is that we have column level lineage. And so it's not that we just have the diff for the table you worked on. We have diffs for every table that inherits data from that table. All the dependencies are downstream to the right or maybe to the left too. I'm mostly to the right, I'm guessing. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. to, the, to the right. I mean, we, we have the lineage going both ways. So you can explore it either way. But when you do a, a pull request, the diff, those only go to the right since it's about inheriting that change downwards. Mm -hmm. And I think this is powerful. If you think about it from a developer having this visibility before their changes are uh, even committed or the pull request comes in, it could exactly. be, yeah, it could be a good step to have. So very fascinating. It, exactly. So, so if we look here, you know, if, if there's a downstream table and there's no changes to it, great. You know, n nothing happened. But if we look at this table here, this beers.promo deliveries table, 
we can see that we are losing rows. Losing rows is almost always a bad thing. Some cases where it's not, but most cases it is. And so this is concerning. This is something I'd want to go look into. So I can go and look up this table. Let's see if I can pull it up real quick here. And while you and while you pull that up, one one question would be around the quality checks. I know with DBT there is integration with things like grade expectations for profiling and qualities. Yep. Do you tap into that framework or do you have something completely separate on your own? Yeah, so I we highly recommend people use DBT tests or grade expectations for doing explicit unit testing. So a DBT test or grade expectation, you're basically saying I expect that this column shouldn't have any null values, or I expect that every value in here should be unique. And so those are really good, just sort of like pass fail criteria for a given column. Now, what, what, where those become not sufficient for are every scenario you didn't think of to test. So, you know, Conceivably, you could come up with a test where every single way a piece of data could be unexpected, but that is kind of not scalable, right? To, to come up with that right. many for every single column, every single table, maintain those, grow that over time. So what you're getting with Datafold isn't uh, a test where you pass or fail. You are just getting... Comparing, you're just doing looking at the difference, essentially. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. You're just being mm -hmm. shown what is actually happening. So you can use your judgment to say... Am I, did I expect the data to play out this way? So this reminds me of a, a, a little quote that just came to mind. It was uh, Dostoevsky or somebody who said this, that all happy families are happy <laughs> in a consistent way, yeah. but all unhappy families are unhappy in unique ways. So right, right. yeah, when things go wrong, coming up with those edge cases could be a challenge. You could certainly have expectations for happy path, but the unhappy right. path is innumerable. So it, Mm -hmm. Precisely. And, and, and again, going back to kind of the founding story, it was a three line SQL change. It was reviewed by two other engineers. They had tests in place and it still got through and took down the whole rides table. So, mm -hmm. yeah, we, we know this happens. This is why most of our customers come, come talking to us is they're saying, Hey, I made a big mistake. I never want to mm -hmm. make a mistake again. And data fold helps them do that. Yeah. So, so again, if we, if we dive in here on this table where we're losing rows, I pulled it up here so we can see the SQL that's generating this table. And sorry, it's a little hard with the zoom. You can see here pretty quickly that we're actually hard coding the previous two categories in this downstream table. So, you know, again, this is a, a problem that we likely would have not have anticipated, right? That some downstream table is hard coding values that we would have needed updated here, but maybe we don't even know what this table is, right? So now that we see this consequence, we can go find who does own this table. How do they want to integrate this change that we're making upstream if they want to at all? But we, we have this opportunity to have a conversation about the impacts of data before things are in production. Because you could imagine a table especially one called promo deliveries that, you know, that table might be powering emails, right? right? And so all of a sudden you could have, what was it? 30 people not getting these promo emails anymore. And it might've taken a while before you recognize that that was even what was going on. Right. Mm, does and, have material operational impact essentially. Yeah. And, and mm -hmm. I, and I think, you know, what's, you know, kind of frustrating about data in general is there is nothing that's telling you for sure what should be correct. And so when things are incorrect, they can often be undetected for a long period of time before somebody goes, hey, that number doesn't look right, or somebody mm -hmm. happens to look into it. But yeah. we're trying to flip that where you're kind of given all that, again, context about what is going to happen up front. So you can have conversations up front, fix things up front, and mm -hmm. introduce a lot fewer bugs into your production data. Okay. Who are the folks that are, are picking up the phone to call data for the most? Are, are these the developers, the engineers, or is this coming from the yeah. business or a combination of both? Like where is that really that need coming from? We're, we're really a practitioner focused mm -hmm. company and that's who reaches out to us. So okay. 
you know, again, people who've had this experience where, you know, they've made one of these huge mistakes, you know, it's not uncommon for us to hear about people who accidentally overpaid vendors, you know, some significant amount because of a SQL change that they didn't catch all the consequences of, or again, people getting the wrong emails or, you know, or, or people just getting frustrated with blowing up the wrong person's staff. You know, in, in all these scenarios, you know, that there's, there's a business cost, but then there's also this slightly more intangible trust cost where that's perhaps even harder to recover, which I think a lot of the other tools in this space generally speak to as well. And, but because it's true and, and, mm-hmm. you know, we, we want to help with that as well. Like you might as well control everything you can, you know, you, the data team should never be breaking, you know, production. Everyone should agree with that. You know, other team, you know, the higher level or further back engineers or third party data sources, you know, those are going to happen sometimes, but you should definitely control the data team's outcome. And with a a tool like Datafold, you're able to do that. And are you able to talk about the column lineage and that dependency graph? I know something like that exists, again, just because how embedded DBT is in all of this. There is some form of a lineage there too as well, but it, it seems like you have your tentacles in a broader sp- space. Can you talk a little bit about that and maybe showcase that? Yeah, data's gotten rather complicated. You know, the DAGs just kind of keep getting more and more intense, it seems like. Perhaps mm-hmm. we'll see kind of, you know, the wave the other way, like with like Mozart data or, or some of these that kind of prepackage more of, of, of the modeling. But yeah, so, you, you know, the typically our customers we see, they have, you know, well over, well, we have a range now, but a lot of them have thousands of tables, right, with a bunch of interdependencies. And so, you know, if you have some issue, how do you find where it could have originated from? Just having table of lineage, you know, doesn't quite cut it or it takes, you know, longer than it should to, to kind of do that, what do you call it, root cause analysis. But when you have, you know, column level lineage, you can kind of more quickly see, you know, what is, how did that one field get inherited, you know, and you can kind of track it back a lot easier. And you can do that in you know kind of either direction. Again, we talked about diff is largely everything downstream, but when there's an issue, typically you're then looking upstream, right? You you tend mm-hmm. to detect issues further down, and so having this kind of ability to traverse you know the DAG with ease, you know, really at least from our customers, you know, makes a huge difference on resolution time for issues. I think I've always used that analogy of you defend downstream and you detect upstream. So pretty cool. Is the data div a separate product or from a licensing perspective, is it just one package you get as a toolkit for developers? Yeah, so it's just it's just one package. So data diff is our, our core offering. You know, you're seeing some other stuff in here, right? Like this, this whole lineage graph, when I was searching through the data, you know, that's maybe catalog-esque, but, you know, it's really just in service of the data diff workflow. So that, that's really all we're focused on. Um, and that's, mm-hmm. that's what we're trying to sell and, and help people with. Okay. And is the diff always manual at the time of the developer doing code review before the pull? Or is that something that could be automated to do this profiling and to surface these issues regularly? Yeah. So, I mean, we do have an API and people have embedded it in all sorts of ways and airflow jobs and crazy things like that. And we do have also an open source offering, which is more targeting replication validations. Basically, we're here to provide this like transparency to what's actually happening to the data. Right. So Mm -hmm. we just kind of walked through what having that diffing capability looks like with lineage as part of your data modeling efforts. Another area where comparing two data sets is really valuable is when you're replicating data from some source database to a target database. So when you're trying to move a bunch of data from, let's say, Postgres to Snowflake, there's a lot of weird reasons why you the, the data sets might not end up matching up. 
And that has to do with batching and hard deletes and also just literal cosmic rays and, and what have you. At, at scale, there's, there's some bizarre reasons why these data sets will get out of sync. And that can be hugely problematic. And so we, we kind of took the same ethos that we had for, uh, you know, kind of testing regressions in, in your pipelines to being able to very quickly compare data from two different data set, from two different databases at, at super, super high speeds. So we're, we're just, we're, we're trying to give people this kind of diffing capability and seeing how many ways in your workflow where this becomes beneficial. And, and when people implement this, this is largely a scheduled, you know, driven product that, mm -hmm. hey, I, I replicated over, now run the diff. Oh, there's an issue. And, and it finds, you know, the exact rows that are, are problematic. All right. Pretty, pretty cool. One other question I had here was around the tools you integrate with. So from the storage perspective, of course, modern tools like Snowflake up there on the list, and then orchestration tools like Airflow and DBT, CICD with GitHub and GitLab, you know, Luca and, and, and Mode, um, as well as I think I'm reading here of, of the screen, High Touch. What's the vision? What's the roadmap as you're building out this, this product and this community? Yeah, so I mean, what we've heard most from our customers is that these downstream integrations really increase the value of date of data of doing a data diff a lot so you know it goes from hey here's what's going to impact uh here's what tables might be impacted when we can also tell them here's what dashboards or charts are going to be impacted or here's what high touch syncs or models are going to be impacted that much more clearly communicates the level of urgency or, or I guess mm -hmm. sensitivity you should take with that pull request. And so we plan on integrating with a bunch more BI tools and, and pretty much the other activation tool in the game is census that's on our roadmap as well. So the, the downstream stuff is really a focus for us over the next quarter or two. Yeah, we, we just did a demo of a high touch to as well with them being that reverse ETR that are touching yeah. the downstream systems. The moment you integrate into that, you get that broad visibility. So. Uh, very fascinating. From a decision-making perspective, what is the the pricing model around this? Is it by calls, by seed, uh, how and how is this deployed uh, for users that want to take this in terms of on-premise, in the cloud, in the VPCs, or is this pure SaaS? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so you know, Dataflow kind of is an interesting story or evolution here. We we started as enterprise, you know, however you want to deploy it, we'll we'll do it type of motion. Uh, with great success, but you know, a, a lot of us wanted to be, you know, kind of truer to our mission, which is about helping data engineers do to do brilliant work. And you know, a lot of data engineers don't work at enterprise level companies, um, and so we tried to create a pricing model that would scale down to one one person teams. So we do have a free tier, a startup tier, a growth tier, and an enterprise. In the enterprise, you get all, all the you know those bonus things you were talking about, VPC on prem, all that all that sort of stuff, which again we we've, we've done for for a while. The rest of it is is a cloud offering. We are currently pricing based on the number of tables that we're indexing for our, the lineage, so that you can run diffs across across it. So mm -hmm. if you have you know a thousand tables within your warehouse. That's you know what we're pricing off of, regardless of the size of those tables. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Because it's it's more about the the code that interrelates than the you know the data itself. If that makes mm -hmm. sense. Oh okay. yeah, that makes sense. And so, where is that compute of the physical diff happening? Is that on your own infrastructure, or are you leveraging? If I think about like Snowflake, would be like the compute within Snowflake to do that diff. Where is that happening from a physical perspective? Yeah, so so we are passing it down to to the database that we integrated with. We mm -hmm. give you controls on sampling, mm -hmm. so you can basically say if you want to be one hundred percent accurate, we can run the diff on literally all the data. But typically, we recommend people do sampling at you know let's say a ninety five percent confidence interval or something like this, and that keeps the spend you know the compute very low. So we give it, a, we allow the, the customer to kind of dial that up or down as they see fit. 
Oh, okay. And even too, for the pro for the profiling aspect, if you're running that on Snowflake, you're just essentially leveraging the, the compute then on, on Snowflake that the customer provides as part of their connection. Correct. And, and again, we give you the controls to say, on what schedule would you like to do this and that sort of thing. Very fascinating. One area too, which comes up quite a bit is the AI ML space. There is a saying that politics is downstream from culture. There's also that belief that AI ML is downstream from good data management and good data practices. So the checks you're providing and the quality you're providing from the data perspective, how do you see that translating into teams that are building AI ML and maybe the, the models that are developed as part of our practices? Well, so, so two thoughts here. One is I saw this tweet today that said basically CI is greater than BI, which is greater than AI. Which, which, I, which I think is correct, right? Like having great mm -hmm. CI is mm -hmm. step number one. That's going to do you way more good. Having great BI is going to get you a ton of value. AI is mm -hmm. kind of the last thing, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's the right way to think about it. And, you know, again, we, we're dedicated to making CI phenomenal for data engineers. Secondly, mm -hmm. I would say, so, so to, to that end, you know, having this sort of visibility into impact gives you a lot more confidence in messing around with models that do end up finding their ways into data science notebooks or ML models that are way downstream, right? So they, they need good CI to order, in order to trust and leverage that data. So that's kind of how we, we play with that, that side of the data world. Oh, okay. Very, uh, very fascinating. I, I think a certain part of me does agree with that sentiment that usually ML is great. There's a lot of value to be had in that and a lot of innovation in that space. But that groundwork, the solid foundation is necessary to make the products that come downstream from AI ML uh, be very effective. Even though uh, having that good foundation doesn't always get the limelight because yeah. no one rewards you for something that doesn't break, right? You always uh, get... Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. And, th and that is one of our challenges. And, and I think also, you know, the, the data world's changed a lot. You know, I think originally, you know, data engineers tended to be engineers who kind of got into the data world. Mm -hmm. And then you've kind of had this, you know, rise of the analytics engineer, which are, you know, analysts kind of dipping their toe into the engineering world. And so there's still quite a bit of an education gap on the analytics or the analyst type people. And I put myself in this category. That's where I came from. But moving into this more engineering world, getting used to, you know, GitHub, Git, CI, testing, all of these are, are new practices for a lot of people in this space now. And so, you know, again, we're trying to be very helpful for, for these folks and for data engineers, but there is a lot of, you know, kind of norms and gaps uh, around how to do uh, good CI well. You know, it's, it's just, it's something that still isn't talked about, I think, enough uh, mm -hmm. in the data space. Yeah. To be honest, that just got me thinking here. Looking at the website, talks about data quality, and I think someone learning there might initially jump into data quality, which is what I did. But I think it's even broader more than just data quality, right? It's almost data ops or CI ops in, in that space, which data is a part of it, but it's more than just the quality of the data. But maybe that's just me reading this. But. No, I, I think that's right. And this is something I think about a lot. Um, mm -hmm. So perhaps we'll, we'll try that framing out next because you know, we came up with this framing of deal with data quality in your pull request to try and make it a little bit more accessible. You know, not instead of calling it CI, you know, kind of saying, you know, using language that people who are newer to the space are more familiar with, mm -hmm. but perhaps we should, you know, go a little bit more whole hog into into speaking technical language it's a it's a debate inside of datafold so i'll add this to that side of the argument <laughs> yeah well hopefully i'm not taking sides here or, or pushing on the wrong buttons <laughs> but anyways one other question is around industry are you seeing verticalization happening within specific industry like life sciences yeah. uh, which is an industry i'm very in tune with or like fintech or commerce or is it yeah. more for functional need that you see as opposed to more of an industry type of need? Well, I, honestly, I mean, those three that you mentioned, we've definitely seen probably the most activity around. So yeah, again, like healthcare, fintech, marketplace, commerce type stuff. And, and it makes sense, right? Because they're, they're dealing with huge amounts of very sensitive data, right? Mm -hmm. you, 
you don't want to send people the wrong healthcare information. You don't want to pay people the wrong amount of money, right? These are super important things. So I think this message of being much more careful when you're modeling data, you know, really resonates with them. But we do have customers kind of across the board and across all sizes. Those three themes or, or verticals do stick out in my mind in terms of resonance from our customers. But again, we have kind of all over the board. I think in general, a lot of companies kind of in this modern data stack wave are sort of buying their first one or, or two or, or set of kind of tools to work on data quality right now, right? And, and so I think there's, you know, a lot of people are kind of figuring out what combination of tooling is mm -hmm. best for them, where they, you know, where they have the least amount of negative stuff happening in production. And uh, you know, we're excited to be part of this kind of wave and movement and excited to, to help more people. Yeah, I think that's very fascinating. You mentioned the modern data stack. I think it's something that each company tends to define what that means for them. Actually, that led me into a question of like the five trans of the world, the non-DBT transformations. Is that something your team is looking at? The legacy type ETL tools and even some of the newer cloud-based ELT tools. Uh, five trans, of course, comes to mind. Matillion and there's a whole space there. What comments would you have about that? About how kind of we interact with those? Yeah. Yeah. So, and the reason, uh, the, re the reason I ask is because for those, you're not going through necessarily code with Git and checking in with pull requests and all of that. Right. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so a couple of things with that. So one is again, if you're, if you are using one of those tools to replicate data from a database to another database, mm -hmm. our open source offering that lets you diff those two things very quickly and find the rows that don't match is just sort of like a, it's open source, it's free. It's like a very obvious, easy thing to integrate that hopefully you forget about and doesn't find any issues. But if it mm -hmm. does, it's going to save you, save your butt. The other way that I see us inevitably working with them, which this isn't set up yet, but to me, the possibility is these companies are kind of the first ones who are aware about third-party vendors changing their data models right? Because they have to then wrangle that and perhaps pass down some schema changes to the end customer, right? Mm -hmm. Now, when they do this right now, you kind of get an email, hey, here's what's going to change. But if they integrated with us or took advantage of our column level lineage, they could potentially say a, a much more impactful statement, which is, hey, this schema change is about to happen and it's going to impact 50 tables and 100 dashboards that you have. And then you're going to pay attention a lot more, right, to that schema change. So I think, I think there's a way for us to help connect that story about how schemas shift and what are the consequences of that. We can provide that consequences part of the story, mm. uh, but yeah, that's all hypothetical right now. Pretty good. Thanks for, for sharing that insight. Now, this is about the demo number, somewhere number 12 or 15 we've done. So thanks for coming on board. A lot of the experience we've taken is folks are looking to build communities and products as well. So Slack channels, Discord channels, and GitHub pages, repos. Where can folks find or learn more about Datafold or get in touch with your community? Are there any forums or communities you want to highlight? Yeah, so, you know, we're... The main two we're active in is DBT Slack and in uh, Locally Optimistic, both of which we have a like a tools channel in there that's dedicated to Datafold. I, it's either tools-datafold or it's datafold-tools. I don't remember which order. It's mm -hmm. probably tools-datafold. And yeah, we're, we're always in there helping people get the most out of the tool. Yeah, we felt like it wasn't necessary to start yet another Slack. There's kind of, we sort of feel like there's enough fantastic communities out there and we're just trying to support those at this point so like for instance we're sponsoring locally optimistics party at the coalesce conference versus you know trying to kind of make our own so you know we're, we're kind of going that route at plenty of people are doing a fantastic job building new communities where we're happy to be parts of of everyone else's okay thanks for sharing that and we're gonna leave 
links to all of that in the description below. And where can folks find you? I'm guessing probably active on LinkedIn as a health of growth. I'm sure you'll be in some of those social channels. Yep. Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter pretty I mean, my name's generic, but I, I think I do show up if you put my name and then data fold. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Well, thanks so much, Matt, for joining. Any last words for the audience? No, this this was great. I got, I'm glad I got the opportunity to, to share more about Datafold. And if anybody has questions, feel free to message me directly. I'd be happy to, to walk you through it. All right. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for coming on board. So there you have it. Datafold, a modern data quality, data observability, automation in a very rich and active space. Links to all of this will be in the description below. Reach out to the team if you have any questions. If you want a deeper dive demo, I'm sure they can go deeper than what we've seen here today. Again, Matt, thanks for coming on board and thanks everyone for watching. We'll see you in the next demo.